highlighting the beautiful windows uh, that adorn our sanctuary. More than just works of art, they are an invention of Conrad Pickle, uh, known to his friends as Connie. This is, he calls it, now I won't remember the word, um, it, it, it's, a, it's hammered glass and it's about an inch thick. So a lot of times you see stained glass and it's very thin and it's used for art and it looks as, as realistic to life as possible. And this is a little more, what would you call it, impressionist type thing because the glass is kind of chunky and it's sort of filled with these other facets, it's faceted. And then it's held together with epoxy, which normally would be very dirty looking. However, with the multiplicity of colors and the light shining through them, they exist for us such beautiful art. And, and it's all in the eye of the beholder. I know that's different for tastes, but I prefer the stained glass that looks like this personally. The, a, a, a little just sort of out of place, but also symmetrical in some other ways. I just think it's very beautiful. But I got to think of it as more beautiful once I learned about what some of the symbols mean. Last Sunday, we talked about this symbol at the top, which is mostly for Roman Catholics, the host and the chalice. You see this, the round circle up there with the cross behind it that represents what we would call in the Methodist Church the bread and the cup. So we, had Holy, we celebrated Holy Communion together last Sunday, and we talked about the symbols and what they meant for the early church, the first century Christians that Paul was writing to in Corinthians. They weren't doing it right, so we had to fix them. And, and that symbol is what leads us. And for some of you, I know that the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, is the most important part of your relationship with God. And so there's your window. Now, something I learned about these windows that I did not know before I started poking around in here was that these windows are covered with tiny crosses. Can you see them? Small crosses. I can't actually touch any of them because I'm too short. But <laughs> this is the lowest one. I'm almost there, right there. And if you look around, I tried to count them and see how many there were. And the reason why I wanted to count them was because they represent the martyrs of the faith. People who devoted their lives and even in their deaths, their deaths were caused by people who did not want Christianity to spread, killing them. And they died on behalf of the faith. They're called martyrs. Now, I think it's important that we celebrate those people. I mean, all of the apostles are included in that group. So that's 12 of them. And then there's a whole bunch more than that. So I was sort of figuring out, maybe it's also people that devoted their lives to the faith as well. And when I was looking at scripture about what these little crosses represent, people who have died in the faith, for the faith, devoting their lives to the faith, I came across Paul's letter to Timothy. And this is 2 Timothy chapter 1. It's, it's really Paul's greeting, verses 1 through 14. And here's how he starts the letter to Timothy. From Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by God's will to promote the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm grateful to God, whom I serve with a good conscience, as my ancestors did, I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night. When I remember your tears, I long to see you so that I can be filled with happiness. 
I'm reminded of your authentic faith. First lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. I'm sure that this faith is also inside you. Because of this, I'm reminding you to revive God's gift that is in you through the laying on of hands. God didn't give us a spirit that is timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. Don't be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share the suffering for the good news, depending upon God's power. God is the one who saved us and called us with a holy calling. This wasn't based on what we have done, but it was based on his own purpose and grace that he gave us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now his grace is revealed through the appearance of our Savior, Christ Jesus. He destroyed death and brought life and immortality into clear focus through the good news. I was appointed a messenger, apostle, a teacher of this good news. This is also why I'm suffering the way I do. But I'm not ashamed. I know the one in whom I've placed my trust. I'm convinced that God is powerful enough to protect what he has placed in my trust until that day. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Protect this good thing that has been placed in your trust through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. May God add his blessing to the reading of the Holy Scripture. So in this passage, Paul recounts that he is keeping the faith of his ancestors, which of course would have been Jews and Pharisees, same God, and that Timothy is stepping in to line with his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. They are the heroes of this passage. They are the part of the reason Paul loves Timothy. They are part of the reason Timothy has become such a pivotal figure in the first century Christian church. The faith passed on from the saint who raised him was an authentic faith. Can anybody relate to that? I hope you can. A faith that lives in Timothy as it lived in his mother and in his grandmother. And that's good news. I wonder if it makes you think about whose authentic faith you inherit. And who's going to inherit authentic faith from you? You see, when we talk about being ready, ready for what's going to happen next, keeping our lamps trimmed and burning for we know not the hour and we want to be invited into the feast, it is not so much keeping yourself clean and, and free from you know, whatever other people would call immorality or different things. It's more about doing the good. Because you know not the hour of the day, have you left an inheritance? And I don't mean a financial inheritance. I don't mean something that you have to go to a lawyer for and sign a whole bunch of papers. I mean that faith inheritance. Whose authentic faith will you inherit? And who will inherit authentic faith from you? For you know not the hour of the day when your life will be taken from you. Have you done it yet? Have you paid it forward? Have you given it out? That's behind this, this idea of having enough oil so that you're ready when the bridegroom comes. Did you prepare ahead of time? Did you know that your life would eventually end? So you put something, something good, something spiritual, something important into the lives of those you've left behind. The small crosses behind me represent the apostles, the disciples, the martyrs of the faith, people 
They represent people, people like you and me. Well, you may not find yourself, I don't certainly, like a martyr or like an apostle or disciple, but they were people, not gods. People who impacted the faith by their witness, who gave it to someone else so that it might be spread along authentic faith. People like you and me that impacted others in a way that Eunice and Lois imparted faith onto Timothy. These for whom the crosses represent are the ones who have passed on the authentic faith for us. I counted 24 of the crosses. Does anybody else have a different count? 26. 26. Thank you, Brian. Gotcha. I, I tried to do it from pictures I had, so I, they were blurry. They represent the martyrs, the teachers, and the faithful. Those who were faithful even in persecution. There's a little bit in this story to Timothy about Paul experiencing the persecution. These small crosses represent those who gave all they had to give for our faith. They get a memorial here on our stained glass windows. So, let's have one for Eunice, right? One for Lois. One for Paul, while we're at it. And 12 for the disciples. That's 15. Help me keep count, Brian. Let's give one to Justin Martyr, early, early days before Christianity was the official, uh, you know, people were still being thrown into the lion's den. Justin Martyr, and how about Perpetua? If you don't know who Perpetua is, I invite you to look her up, and you'd read some cool things. So that's 17. How about bringing it more into today? Dr. King lost his life for the faith, was assassinated. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Christian leader who was also killed by the Nazis, 19. And maybe we can move on from they that lost their lives because of the gospel to those who devoted their lives to the gospel but not necessarily died as a result of it. I'm thinking of the most recently departed Desmond Tutu, 20. Billy Graham, 21. How about the Queen, 22, Mother Teresa, 23, and I submit to you a Catholic priest, Canadian, Father Henry Nowen. He's a writer and an educator. He died in 1996, before I was born. Just kidding. <laughs> I was a senior in college, and I already had read, as a part of my curriculum in religion classes, his book, In the Name of Jesus. And so his death is a day I remember. I was sitting in uh, an ethics class that I was not doing well in. <laughs> and I learned the news because the, um, our, our professor, who's a Presbyterian, had retired and we got a new professor and he was like 27 years old and a Roman Catholic. I was like, how are we going to learn from this guy? It's my senior year in religion. Major. But of course, being Roman Catholic, he shared with the class about now and death. Yeah, I remember where I was. I remember exactly where I was. And that's bookish and nerdy. It is. As a college student. His writings, though, live on. And I read his simple books on church leadership and on following Jesus. And he is one who has imparted authentic faith for sure to me. Although he taught at Harvard and Yale, he left academia and all that loftiness to live in the large community, a sort of group home for people with varying intellectual abilities and varying physical abilities. His last book, most would say, that 
most of his books were just experiences. This, most of his best books were these experiences from these communities. But his last book was even published after his death. The title was Adam, God's Beloved. In the story, Adam, he found a way to describe, this is now one, found a way to describe his understanding of the gospel message through the life of this man, his friend, Adam. Adam could not speak or even move without assistance, and he was frequently gripped with seizures. He spent his life in what most of us would think of as obscurity, and yet for now and he became a friend, a teacher, and a guide. Adam led Father Nowen to a new understanding of his faith and what it means to be God's beloved. Not able to speak or move on his own, he taught and imparted the faith. Nowen wrote the book as a memorial to Adam, who did eventually die of his seizures. And through this story, Nowen found a new way to tell God's story and the story of all human creatures who are broken yet beloved and who live in a world charged and alive with the mystery of God's love. And I submit to you today that if Adam could impart faith with all his limitations into this fancy professor with all these published works, then what can you do to impart faith as Lois and Eunice had done to Timothy into the next generation? What's our count, Brian? We, what? How did we get to 29? You added some? You're at 29? Oh, there's 29 crosses. Oh, so we have more. Okay. Where was the count with the people we got names for? We had 25? 24? Okay. Adam will be 25. Can we put Adam there? And that leaves space for more. And since today is 9-11, I would like to add another name. Ugh, another Catholic priest. Sorry about that. It's a Catholic day. Um, <laughs> for those who gave their life in service on that day, because we don't have 415 crosses up there for all those who rushed into disaster on that day. The popular chaplain of the New York Fire Department was one of those lost. Reverend Michael Judge was a Catholic priest, a Franciscan, and a man who was remembered as carrying dollar bills in his pocket to hand out to homeless people. He was one of the first priests in New York City to minister with people suffering from AIDS. When no one else would go, Father Michael was there. And that's besides the many last rites administered to the fallen firefighters to care for the widowed and orphaned that they left behind. And then there's what he did on September 11th, 2001. The call went out, and Father Michael who does not drive the truck or operate the fire hoses. He is the man of the cloth. And nonetheless, he joined the department to provide comfort to the fallen and inspiration to the bravest among us. He did that until he died in the lobby of the North Tower that day. There's a movement to canonize him as a saint, but those who are closest to him say that he wouldn't have approved of that. He's a Franciscan, after all. He's a guy that wears sandals. <laughs> they say it takes away his humanity, and that he would say that too. In a sense, it says, being canonized as a saint, is, it says, you are a holy thing now. The witness of Father Michael was that he chose to be a holy human 
every day of his life. He struggled on the path. When he died on 9-11, he had 23 years sober and was a prominent member of the AA community in New York City. He was also a supporter of the LBDTQ community and a fierce preserver of the dignity of all persons in their lives and especially in their deaths as a priest. It was his choice to live his faith the way he did, to follow Jesus into the lobby of the towers that day. And it's a choice for all of us to live those kind of lives. But once we get on that path, we do get the help that we need. All these people doing these amazing things, you know, the queen leading a country for more than 70 years, and this, this chaplain, this humble man rushing into the disaster to help the firefighters and the first responders. You have all these lofty folks doing all these amazing things. I mean, how could I do that? It's just too much. Once we get on the path, we get help. We get the help that we need. This is essentially what Paul was saying to Timothy, trying to encourage him to keep going. He's encouraging him to remember and revive, those were Paul's words, God's gift that is in him. Reminding him that God didn't give us a timid spirit. But imagine that Father Michael read this passage before he went there that day. God did not give us a timid spirit, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. So don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Instead, share the suffering for the good news and depend on God's power. God is the one who saved and called us with a holy calling. This wasn't based on what we have done, be it good or bad. Not based on what we have done, but was based on his purpose and grace. Not us, but God. You see, when we get on that path, we get the help we needed. His purpose and grace that he began in us. And he began in Christ Jesus before time began. This is the, the faith that Paul believes that Timothy needs to carry on into the future. So while it is our choice to be followers of Jesus, we're not always meant to be alone. We're meant to live abundant life together and we cooperate with the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to do the unthinkable. God is giving us grace every step of the way. Grace that will help us to impart authentic faith to the next generation because we don't know how much time we have. We've got to keep our lamps trimmed and burning. We have to keep vigilance and not necessarily sit in your room and pray and read your Bible, but put that faith into someone else. Let them know who God is and what God means or what they mean to God. Authentic faith. And God gives us the grace to help us to live those lives, lives that may even for you and me be worthy of the small crosses. I dare say you could find a person that you could put to represent some of these crosses up here. They're personal to you. They're people in your own life. The faith that was imparted to you, they're represented here. But what if we could be part of those crosses too? To live a life and someone else would come long after our death and say, that cross, that's for my aunt, my father, my uncle, my husband, my brother, my friend, who showed authentic faith to me. We could be 
the small crosses, to help our fellow human beings find abundant life in Christ, to help us die as those who go on to live with the witness of our lives as a testimony left behind to the power of God's great love. That is our charge. Amen. As we conclude the worship service, as an affirmation to God, we are singing our closing hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, Ode to Joy, by none other than Beethoven himself. And uh, if you would stand as you are able as we sing together this.